Greenland or the Arctic or something. Like <laughs> we won't feel too bad. How you all doing? You good? Good. We're doing great. Very well. Good. So great. we know you're suffering. What's the temperature? Go ahead. Tell us the truth. What is it? Probably about 75 right now. Uh, all right, yeah. We're getting off that right away before we have a riot. How, so how, how long have you been down there in Ecuador? We've been here six months now. We got here in August. You got in August, six months. So what, what's been the hardest part of the transition from, because from, you lived, you could walk to church. They lived right around here on, on Bristol Road, two blocks away. So what's been the hardest transition besides the un, unnerving bad weather you're having? <laughs> Living in Ecuador is, is very, very different, not just in our everyday lives, but uh, I think the biggest thing, transition, is just what we see in our ministry is the desperate need that we see every day. Um, you know, last week we were out at the, the Women at Risk Center with 10 girls ranging from 13 years old to 18 years old that had just been pulled out of sexual trafficking. Mm. And um, you hear their stories and your heart breaks um, it's hard to know what to do. Mm. Now, over the Christmas parties, we handed out 5,000 Christmas um, bags. But there was thousands of people in line waiting that couldn't get any. Yeah. And, um, you know, when it's just so different. You know, it's, um, we have need in the States. Um, we have those kind of things, people that need Christ. But um, it's overwhelming. It can be really overwhelming, and it's different. So... What, what would you say like it's been like in the six months, what, what's been a high point of the ministry? What, what's been a success? Where have you taken some ground? Uh, anything well, particular? In those, in those parties, we, we had a party at the garbage dump with 3,000 people. Over 400 people came to know Christ that day. You know, oh, awesome. and um, so we we're seeing huge impacts. Awesome. And we praise God in that. So, um, you know, you got to get it that way. You can't look at the negative. Yeah. And, you know, we don't run out of Jesus. We can run out of Christmas bags, yeah. but we don't run out of Jesus, right? Is, that, is so. that your dog? Do you want to bring him in or what? No. no. Oh, next door. Okay. What's your, what, what's the expectations for the year? What do, what, do you, what do you hope to get done, like, for the rest of the year? What's your... Well, this summer we have, from March through August, we have about 20 work teams coming down. How many? So I'm going to be working 20, wow. 20 teams. Wow. So, um, you know, our goal is to, to have those be life-altering experiences for not only for the teams that come down, but the people that they serve. Okay. That they will have an experience that they can't walk the same way anymore. They can't live their life the same way. Right. So, um, well, tell us, how, how can the church here in Shelfont... How can we pray for you guys, for your family, for the work there? What's the best, what, what do you need us to be praying about? I think if, um, if you guys could just continue to pray for the boys. We have two boys, they're um, six and eight years old, Noah and Aiden. And um, we knew coming down here, they had some special education issues. And we, um, we had a meeting with the school within a month and they said that Noah needed an aid, which we were expecting. Um, we weren't shocked by it. And yeah. God gave us this amazing girl named Amanda, who was a fabulous aide for him, and it's been a great year, and she's going to stay throughout the year, but then she's leaving in June when the year's done. Great. So if you guys could just pray for the future for both of them and some of their educational issues, and we know God's going to come through, but, um, you know, just to keep them in prayer for Pray next for year. the kids, pray for the family, and pray for some great evangelism opportunities right. in Quito. Yeah. Okay, listen, and you have some people here in the fellowship hall. They have a sign-up. They have some material out there. Sign up and get on their mailing list and, and read their emails, read their newsletters. It's, it's fantastic stuff going on down there. And pray for these guys while they're away. Right? Yep. Yes, Amen. Definitely. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. God bless you. There you go. Stay God warm. Bye-bye. I can't hear you, but can you hear me? Oh, great. <laughs> you took care of that dog? Okay. All right, good. Good morning, everybody. Open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. The Emery's are sitting in for church. So, isn't that cool? Um, just a couple things before we get started, uh, and, and one of those is that on, uh, I know that you know that on Wednesday nights we have a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, and we've been in First Thessalonians uh, each night. We had, um, we did chapter four this last week, and um, this coming uh, Wednesday 
we're going to do a study on the rapture, uh, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, uh, from verse 13 to verse 18, deals with um, the rapture of the church. And I realize that many people are confused about this. Um, many people have been made to be confused about this over the years, which is really sad because the Bible is not confusing. It's people and well, I was going to say, people and the way they teach it sometimes um, makes it confusing. But uh, I really believe that it's not intended by God to be confusing. It's our blessed hope. We're looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, and now more than ever, we're looking for him. And so it's important for us as believers to not just consider this just some other factoid that we throw in the back of our spiritual brains, but rather that we understand this and understand why we should be looking forward and, and just how near is the time of his appearing and so and is coming and is calling for us so um, please make a point if you can to be out with us on Wednesday night and the second thing before we pray is um, we've had a lot of new people enter into the church and we're glad that you're here uh, over the course of the last few months two things number one is we will have a uh, a new to Calvary soon in the springtime. We're going to have a new to Calvary and we're going to want you to attend and so that you get to know us, we can get to know you. But also in the meantime, uh, when you when you leave today, make a point, please. Just stop by and I'm, I'm always standing out there. Introduce yourself. Uh, I'll do my best to remember your name and uh, get to know you guys a little bit. So please do that. Let's pray before we get into the word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your faithfulness. We thank you for your word and we thank you for um, all that you've given us in, in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we do have a blessed hope. We confess that so often we've placed our hope, Lord, in our bank accounts or in our homes or in our jobs or in people, Lord, in so many things other than you. Even though we know you as Savior, we have so often placed our hope so many other places. And so, Lord, um, we sit here today knowing that you alone are God, that you alone are Savior and King and Lord, that you alone, Father, sent your Son to die for us, and only Jesus could have done that, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for those we know who are suffering right now, Lord, who, but who know you, who suspect that the time is coming when you will call them out of this world, Lord, but they know you, and they're going to see you face to face. Lord, strengthen them through these times. Encourage them. Lord, for those who have gone through the process of saying farewell to someone they love recently, Lord, we lift them before you as well and pray that you would just comfort their spirits, knowing their loved one is with you because of the faith they placed in you. And we ask, Lord, that you take from your word this morning and that you would feed our spirits, our souls, Lord. And help us, Lord, to grow in grace and really in the knowledge of Jesus as we study this ancient book, 3,400 years old, Lord, that we would see you in the midst of it. And, Lord, as ancient and as important as it is, you would make real personal application to our lives, Lord. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd open your word to us and us to your word right now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, we're in Joshua chapter 1, and I don't know what kind of obstacles you're facing in your life right now, what giants you feel that you can't get over, but we all have them. For some of us, they're bigger than for others right now. For some of us, um, things are better maybe than they were a few months ago or a couple of years ago, and then there are those of us for whom they're right in front of us, and we don't know what to do. And we pray, and, we, and yet we feel like nothing ever changes. And I really believe that as we walk through this book together over the course of the coming months, we're going to see a lot of things here that God wants to teach us about his power and about his intentions for our lives. We finished Deuteronomy last week. We saw that Moses, after 120 years, had died. After 40 years of leading the nation through the wilderness. God took his spirit from him, buried his body somewhere that no one knows, and has appointed Joshua now as the one who's going to lead the nation. And it's just really just a matter of days away before they actually cross the Jordan River on dry ground and go into the land that God had promised for them. 
And it's important that we understand that Israel failed to enter into the promised land 38 years earlier. They had opportunity to go in, but they failed to go in. And the reason they failed to go in is because spies were sent out, 12 of them. And that was okay that these 12 spies were sent out. And one of them was Joshua, another one was Caleb. And I'll bet that no one else remembers the names of the other 10 spies. But the two who came back with the good report are the ones that we remember. These were young adults that were sent out. Joshua was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 22, 23 years old when he went out. So often we think these are old people. No, they get old. They start out young. And some of us know that. Others will learn it. And, and, and so Joshua was one who came back and said, we should go, we should go into the land. The other spies, the 10, who gave the wicked report, they, they agreed it was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. They agreed that, that it was everything God had said that it was. But they also pointed out the land was filled with giants. Too often we put that in the, in the realm of fantasy or mythology, but the reality is the land was filled with giants. And, and you can check it out for yourself online. Well, there's a lot of goofy stuff online too, but you can, you can research this for yourself to see that in fact, that land, not just in Israel, but in many parts of the world, there were giants at one time. And there were giants in the land, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet tall. And to think of how big, we're not just talking the, the height, but the girth of these people. It's estimated that many of them had to, had to consume upwards of 30,000 calories a day just to maintain their, their body weight. And imagine that. No, I can't imagine. <laughs> uh, the problem is we don't get taller when we do that, okay? Um, but that's really what it was like. And, and Joshua and Caleb said, absolutely, the land is filled with giants, but we should go in. And the, and the guys with the evil report said, no, we should not go in because we were as grasshoppers in their sight and also, the key, key phrase, also in our own. We saw ourselves as unable to go up against these guys. Joshua and Caleb were like, come on. God has done all of this already. He's, he's, he's shown himself so powerful, so miraculous. He's done all of these things already. He's made us this promise that we should go into this land that he has for us. And he's told us that he will give us the victory. And imagine what it's like then after traveling with those guys to see them and all of the other people pick up stones to kill you because you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you will be vocal, you can expect that people are going to be very angry with you. And they're not going to accept that this is the truth, but it is the truth. And so there's a lot of personal application we can, we can take from this. They're standing here at the border. They're standing at the Jordan River. And they made a choice years ago as a nation not to go in. Now all of that nation, all of the, the elder generation, who believed the, the spies with the wicked report are dead. Only two from that generation are alive, and that's Joshua and Caleb, because they're allowed to go into the promised land. Everybody else is a child of the Exodus generation. And while they had chosen 38 years earlier not to go in because of the giants, they had chosen not to go in because of these cities that were strong, they, had, they were fortified, they had these, in, these big walls around them. They had chosen not to go in because of the power of the enemy. Now God was saying, you're gonna go in, and Joshua, you're going to lead them in. How would you feel? If you're Joshua, how would you feel? See, this, you have to take this out of the realm of what seems like fiction to us sometimes, and think, okay, now you've got those guys there across the river, they know you're coming. We've, we learn that later on as you start to study through the book. They know you're coming. You think they're not ready? They're ready for you. They'll devour you, that's exactly it. So, and, and many times we experience that in our life. The enemy stirs up so much fear in us about what someone or some situation is going to do to us, and that's what they were facing here. A little background before we go any further. We're talking about a guy who we, we use his name all the time. This is the first book in the Bible. This is the sixth book of, of the Bible, and it's the first one that's named after a person. His name, first time we meet Joshua, 
uh, is back in Exodus chapter 17. He was the one in the battle at Rephidim against the Amalekites. He was the one, a general, a young general, who was leading the battle against the Amalekites. This is when Moses is on top of the mountain with his arms up and Aaron and Hur have to hold his arms up. It's Joshua down, down in the valley who's leading the charge. It's Joshua who's consistently the one who's leading the charge. His name at that time was not Joshua. His name was Oshia or Hoshia, depending upon your translation. Hoshia, it means that he, he saves or he delivers. And later on, soon after this, Moses will change his name to Yahoshia, okay, or Yahoshua. And we say Joshua, but there's no J in Hebrew, so Yahoshua. He puts the Yah from Yahweh in front of his name. So it's really the Lord delivers, the Lord saves. That becomes his name. And, and over the centuries and the, and the subtle changes in the Hebrew language, we're talking about a man who has the very same name as our Savior, Jesus. That's his name. That's Jesus' name, Yeshua. That's, that's the name of the swan. So it's very interesting that the first book in the Bible with a named after somebody is named after our Savior. And he's a, uh, he's a very interesting young man. He's, we know him as Joshua, the son of Nun. And uh, he, his father was uh, a descendant of Ephraim, which in one sense means nothing to us, except Ephraim was one of Joseph's um, two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, uh, and Ephraim was highly blessed by God. And, and, and so that means he's a descendant of Joseph, which is a big thing if, if you're an Israelite. Um, it still doesn't mean a whole lot to us. So think about this, though. If you remember anything about the Passover, this is the firstborn son of this man named Nun. So I imagine the Passover made a big impression on Joshua since had it not been for the blood that had been put over the lintel on the door, he'd have been dead. And there'd be, there'd be no story about Joshua. There'd be no story about fighting the Battle of Jericho. There'd be none of that because he'd have died. Okay? This meant a lot to him. He took it very personally. And we see him as just a guy. He's the son of a slave. Compared to Moses... Moses, who had been the prince of Egypt. Moses, Moses who had been educated in all the ways of Egypt. Moses, who knew everything about business and power and politics and money and all of these things and, 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 and was the, the greatest military leader that Egypt ever had. Moses, his assistant, the one who's his right-hand man, is a guy who's the son of a slave, who never had that education or the benefit of that kind of thing that Moses had, but he learned everything from being around Moses, and that becomes important to us as we, as we read through this. Anointed by God as Moses lays his hands on him in Deuteronomy chapter 31, he's the one who's to succeed Moses, and this is where it happens. So it says in verse 1 that after the death, that's what your Bible may say, or now, it may be the first word, but after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the children of Israel. I just do want to point this out. It doesn't say in our English Bibles, unless you have a different translation than the ones I mentioned, um, it doesn't say in our English Bibles, but in Hebrew it says, and. And I realize that doesn't mean much on the surface, but when we accept the fact that everything in Scripture is there by God's design, if you believe that, I do. I take a high view of Scripture. I believe that everything, that God is the author, and he used 40 different human writers. Now, Genesis begins with the word in, in the beginning. Literally, in Hebrew, that's, that's what it begins with. But Exodus begins with and, and these are the names of those who went down to Egypt. Um, Leviticus begins with and, and the Lord called out to Moses there in, in the plains of the wilderness. Uh, Numbers begins with the word and, uh, and there in the wilderness. Okay? So these all begin with and. Deuteronomy doesn't do that. You say, well, so what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's interesting because 
Genesis begins, and, and really these, the differences in what we call these books are in some ways artificial. God continues to reveal to Moses all the things that he wants him to write down. But, but there's a distinction, it's called the end of the scroll, and, and th that distinction is the end of one, the beginning of another. So and is just and the, the story continues, the narrative continues from the end of Genesis into Exodus, from the end of Exodus into Leviticus, from the end of Leviticus into Numbers. But at the end of Numbers, where we learn that almost everybody, or pretty much, basically everybody from the old generation had died. Deuteronomy, if you remember in our study, it's the reciting, the second telling of the law. So it's like the, it's a new beginning in a sense in Moses. There's no and there. But Joshua begins with and, and Judges begins with and, and Ruth begins with and, and the Samuels begin with and, and the Kings begin with and, and First Chronicles begin with and. In other words, God says, there's a continuous thing that I'm revealing here. And, and, and some of you are thinking, and this is getting really boring because what does this have to do with anything? This is what it has to do with. Because it indicates that the spirit of, the God, the spirit of God is the one who is running this thread through all of these books. Especially here with Joshua. You take Joshua out between Deuteronomy and Judges. And if you're familiar with those books, what would you do with the book of Judges if there was no Joshua? What sense would it make to you to finish Deuteronomy and start Judges? It would make no sense. You have to have Joshua to understand what this is about. You have to have the Judges really to understand Ruth and to understand the Samuels. So, so there's, a, there's a continuity here. And God says, I've called you and I want you to, to go over. I'm going to give this land to you, to all the people. He's Moses' assistant. He has learned everything from being with Moses all of these years. And when, when, if you think to the time when um, the, the golden calf was being fabricated down in the valley, Moses is up on the mountain. We always think of Moses up on the mountain, mobs of people down in the valley, and they say to Aaron, you know, where is this Moses? He's never coming back. You know, make us, make us a God that we can worship. And, and Aaron says, okay, well, give me your... Give me your, take off your watches and take off your earrings and give me your bracelets and everything and, and threw them into the fire and he fabricated this golden calf. And of course, we know the story that, you know, Moses comes down and says, what's up here? And Aaron says, I don't know, you know, it just happened. And he's the high priest. It's Moses and Aaron. Aaron is the high priest. We're not thinking much of Joshua right now, but where was Joshua this whole time? Joshua was with Moses on the mountain. Joshua is a guy who has had has personal experience with so much of what Moses also experienced because God was using all those experiences to prepare him for this. And the reason I say that is I, you know, in the first service I started to do the counting, I realized, wow, it's been a long time. 25 years I was in business, 15 years I've been a pastor. I thought I just got out of college. And... Um, <laughs> But you know what? In 25 years in business, I never experienced what at times I've experienced in ministry. And by that I mean this. There's an understanding, and there always was, maybe it changed, but there was always an understanding in the business world that you need to cut your teeth on something. You need to get some experience before you're going to move into some other position. You need to get some experience. You need to demonstrate that you have the chops. You, need, you, know, you, need to, you need to show that you can do the job before someone's going to promote you and give you some other position. That's a clear understanding. And here's, here's Joshua, an example of that. He's been the assistant to Moses for 40 years now. And God has prepared him through those experiences. And yet I've seen in ministry very often where someone says, you know, I feel that God is speaking to me and he's saying that I should, well, I'll preach on Sunday or, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, well, wait a minute. How do you, where'd that come from? What, why, would you, why would you think to do that? Well, because God's telling me, and that, which is always the trump card. You know, when someone throws down the trump card, they, they take the hand. Or, you know, like no one plays cards. You know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> Can you say that in church? Yeah. And so, so... God told me is always the trump card. So when someone says, God told me this, what do you have to say back? Well, I think the thing you have to say back is, prove it. 
I find it fascinating. I've seen it over the years where people from time to time will come up and, and think that they should have some great position of some sort, because they think you know, position is glorious in church, uh, that they're going to have some great position and they're going they're to, to, to rule over some area of the church. Well, have you, how about Sunday school? Have you ever taught in Sunday school? Have you ever been an usher? Did you ever, no, 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 I just really feel that God is calling me to this. I've never experienced that in the business world. I never experienced that in these other places. It's in church for some reason that people feel that, that they can do that. I'm gifted, and, 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 and I'm not, don't think I'm mocking that, I'm not. But God uses experience. Equipping comes by his spirit. Empowerment comes by his spirit, and experience comes by walking it, by just doing it, day after day after week after month. And, and, and Joshua has experienced this. He's been uh, the assistant to Moses through all of this time. He's, and says, God says, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place, look at that, look at what he's saying there. Look at it. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have, that's past tense. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I said to Moses. From this wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This land was given to them. Now this is 1406. The most conservative scholars would say 1405, 1406 BC. This is happening. We're in 2014. So we're talking 34, give or take, 100 years ago. God said this to Joshua, but he said it much, much longer ago than that, around 2100 BC. So now we're talking over 4,000 years ago. He said the same thing to Abraham, great, 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 great grandfather of, of Joshua. He says, you don't have to turn there, but you can write it down in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where, where, where God is reiterating the covenant. Did I say 6? I meant to say uh, verse 18. God says this to, to Abraham. He says, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt. What do you think that would be? The Nile, the big, big Nile, okay? From the river of Egypt, from the Nile River to the great river, the river Euphrates. Anybody know where that is? Let's just say Iraq, okay? The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. God's saying, I'm giving it all to you. From all the way to the south, the Nile River, all the way up to the area that we call Lebanon today, out to the Mediterranean, which is, you know, you can't go any further, that's the ocean, to eastward, to the river Euphrates, God says, I am giving all all of that to you. Now to Abraham, he mentions all these people groups and we go all these ites, termites, and parasites and all these. The, the, they're important. They become important as we read through the scripture because most of them are giants. Most of them are 10 to 15 feet tall. Most of them are fierce warriors. I mean, it's one thing to, and the average man in those days was about five foot. That was a good sized man, okay? It's one thing to go up another, against another good-sized five-foot man who's a fierce warrior, have two fierce warriors at war. But what do you do against a 15-foot man who eats 30,000 calories a day, okay, and sees you as lunch? <laughs> what do you do? I mean, come on, these are the things that we don't think about, but they were thinking about this, and God's saying all of them. They're all going to be yours. You're going to go in to Abraham, he tells them, and rid the land. That's what he's going to tell Joshua. And we'll deal with that issue at another time about ridding the land of them. But he says, you're going to go in and you're going to have all of this. Who said it? God said it. God said you're going to have it. In fact, when he says to Joshua, everywhere the sole of your foot goes down, I have given it to you. Anywhere you will go, I have already given it to you. God had already made that decision long before there was a United Nations, 
long before there was a Hamas, long before there was a PLO, long before there was any of this, long before there was an American government who disagreed with those things. God had already said, this is what it's going to be. Let's put it in another perspective. In round numbers, we're saying that that, that range from the Euphrates to the Nile to Lebanon to, to the Mediterranean, that's about 300,000 square miles. It means very little. In the, in the glory days of, of Israel, uh, King David, King Solomon, Israel had the most territory it had ever had, about 30,000 square miles, only 10% of what God had promised. Right now, Israel occupies about 27,000 square miles as Israel sees their rights, as the United Nations sees their rights, and as our present administration sees their rights and would have it, it would be more like 19,000 square miles, just to give you some perspective. But God says, I have given this to you. And if God says that, it may not look like that right now, but you can bet it's going to end up that way. God says, I have given it to you. And one of the things that you can find as an interesting study on your own sometime is as, as you walk through the the book of Joshua and some other areas, but as you walk through the book of Joshua, there will be some areas where they didn't actually rid the land of all the enemies. And those become the places, when you study them, that you'll find out today are still the hot spots, are still the places where their enemies are. Even though they're not the same peoples, they're still the hot spots. It's just the way God works. He's saying, everywhere you set the sole of your foot, I'm going to give it to you, but you have to set the sole of your foot. You have to go in. And by the way, that's where this becomes very personal. You can bet it was personal for Joshua. That becomes very personal for us too. You have to set the sole of your foot down. You have to have the guts to go in. God's going to say, you need to be strong. You need courage. Don't be, don't be dismayed. Go do it because I'm giving it to you. You need to do this. So, real quick one. Jericho. Um, in Hebrew, okay, I'll just put it this way. In Hebrew, the, the, the name for Jericho is House of the Moon, okay? House of the Moon. Yerach in Hebrew is, is moon, so oh, Hebra, in Hebrew is moon. So Yeracho is his moon, house of his moon, basically. Um, which you're, I know, that's really fascinating to you. But, so they, they went in and to conquer these peoples. Uh, anybody know the name of the Muslim God? What's the name of the Muslim God? Allah, which is a, a new form of the Arabic, or, or an Arabic form of the old pagan God, Al, for God, Al Ilya, the moon God. Interesting how it goes around, comes around. I'll just leave it there. So, God says, I want you to go in, and anywhere you set the sole of your foot, I have already given it to you. It's a gift. Listen to this. It's a gift. He's saying, you didn't do anything to deserve it. I have already given it to you. I made the promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to your fathers before you. I'm giving it to you. It's a gift. But you must go in and take it. You know, the exact same thing is true when it comes to our salvation. It's a gift. We talk about it all the time. But the reality is the gift of eternal life is a gift of eternal life. We can't do anything to, to uh, merit this gift. We can't please God by the way that we live or the things that we give up or any of those things. It's by trusting that, that he actually made the payment to pay the price for our sins and to purchase us. We, we use the terminology to purchase our redemption, to buy us back. He already did that. It's a gift. But like any other gift, whether we're talking Christmas or a birthday or any other time, somebody gives you a gift, the first thing you have to do is to reach out your hand and to take the gift. You have to take it. But that doesn't mean anything until you take the wrapper. You've got to take the wrapping paper off. And that doesn't mean anything until you open it up and ultimately until you own it as your own. Say, this is mine. I've taken the gift. I received this gift. Or in terms of salvation, I believe this personally. If you've never done that, you're just putting a, a gift on the shelf. You just keep hearing about a gift, but the gift is yours for the taking. You must take it. 
you know, there was a, there was a guy by the name of George Wilson, 1829. He was convicted of mail robbery. Those were the days people cared about that stuff. Now it's all about the internet, right? But mail robbery and murder. And because that's a federal crime, he was in a federal uh, penitentiary. But a lot of evidence was confused. And, and when, it, when it all went through the courts, ultimately, they couldn't really hold up a solid conviction. There were all these appeals. And so finally, President Andrew Jackson, we're talking the 1800s, Andrew Jackson pardoned him. He pardoned him. Think about that. You're in a federal penitentiary. You are facing the gallows. And the President of the United States, the last one who has authority in, 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 in our country, sends down a pardon, and you are set free. And he refused to take the pardon. And he was scheduled to go to the gallows. And everybody was up in arms. He's been pardoned. And it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court Justice Marshall wrote the opinion. And he said, a pardon is a piece of paper until it's accepted. So he went to the gallows. They put a, a bag over his head and a noose around his neck and pulled the lever. And in a few seconds, he was dead because he didn't receive the pardon. You have any idea how many people never receive the pardon? How many people never take the gift? How many people hear it over and over and over and over again, but it's just on a piece of paper? That's all it is, because they don't receive it for themselves. Don't walk away without receiving the gift. Just as God is promising to, to Israel and through Joshua, this land is yours, you must go in and take it. He's saying to you, this salvation is yours, but you must reach out and receive it. You must believe it for yourself. And so God says, I'm giving it to you. Again, look at verse 3. Every place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I, God speaking, I have given to you, just as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand against you or before you. Same thing. Think about that. Wherever you go, despite how big those guys are, no matter how much they eat per day, no one will be able to defeat you, is basically what God is saying, will stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. You can call that the Emmanuel principle. We think of Emmanuel, we think Christmas. Okay, God with us, though, is what it means. I will be with you. And it's not some arcane Old Testament concept. This is very much a New Testament concept that very often we forget. Because I started off by saying, you know, we all have our giants that we're up against. We all have our obstacles that we're up against. We all have these things that are frightening us right now. It could be uh, someone we love dearly in our family who's really sick. It could be a financial problem. It could be, you know, there's a long list of things. They're giants. They're obstacles. They're, they're things that freak us out. They make us really scared. God is saying, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah, John, but that, that was said to Joshua. He said it to you. Jesus said it to you and to me. Matthew 28, beginning in verse 18. All power, think of how much that is. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you, and lo, that's kind of like, whoa, okay, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. All through the days of your life, all through the days of my life, I know that he is with me because he promised that he would be with me. So just as he said to Moses, just as he said to Joshua, just as Jesus said to the apostles, he is saying to you and me, he is with us. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, he says, he himself has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He's my strength, right? He's the one who gets it done. The Lord is my help, helper. I will not fear what can man do to me or what can man do do to that loved one of yours? Or what can someone do to you? You're probably thinking, if you're cynical like me, you're thinking, well, I can come up with a list. But ultimately, whose are you? 
If you're in Jesus Christ, whose are you? And if you're not in Jesus Christ, you can answer that question and you got even more trouble. Okay? Because if the only one who has any control over our lives is me, I'm in deep yogurt. Okay? But if I know that he owns me, yes, the tide's going to come in and the tide's going to go out in our lives. Things get good and things aren't so great sometimes. It's just the way life is. It's called living in a fallen world. People get sick. Loved ones get sick. Sometimes they get better. Sometimes they plateau and sometimes they get worse. The reality is that there's a, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time for joy. There's a time for weeping. The Bible says all these things. Do we believe it or do we not believe it? Is God good or is he not good? He is good. He said, I'm never going to leave you and I'm never going to forsake you. There's a reason he says this. Because we're going to go through tough times. Look at verse 6. We're going to wrap up. Don't worry. I thought we'd go through you know, three, four chapters this morning. We'll just go through two or three. Uh, verse 6. So God says to him, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. That you may prosper wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Genesis, Deuteronomy, okay? That's all he's got. We have 66 books. He had five. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate. In other words, to, to, some people say chew the cud. That's one way of translating the word in Hebrew. Or to mutter, to consider, to mull it over is the idea. To take the word. Don't just read something, but really think. What does that really mean? What is God trying to say to me? How does he apply it to my life? That you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Only be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You got to be thinking that Joshua is thinking right now. All right, three times I've heard this. Be strong and of good courage. What is ahead of me? And I have a feeling, I used to say that kind of as a joke, but I, I got a feeling he had a good idea. Didn't know it all, certainly. But he had enough of an idea of what was there. He'd already been a spy in that land. In fact, it's not just three times. Later on, by the end of this chapter, the people are going to say back to Joshua, we're going we're gonna to be with you. We're going to follow you. Let no man you know, disobey you. Uh, only you be strong and courageous. They want their leader to be strong and courageous. We see when, when Joshua is... Uh, ordained, we'll say, into this position. When Moses lays hands on him in Deuteronomy chapter 31, three times he's told, only be strong and courageous. Seven times in, in this whole process he's being told, be strong, be courageous, don't be dismayed. What does that mean? That means set your sight on what God has called you to go do, Joshua, and go do that. And there, there's lots of reasons in this world for us to be frightened. There's lots of reasons in this world and in what he was going to do to freak out but be strong. We say, Lord, make me strong. God's saying, be strong. Well, where does it come from? Does it come from me or does it come from God? He's saying, you make the choice. Are you going to be strong? Are you going to be strong? Are you going to follow what God has said to do? See, because that's an act of the will. God will, or will, will strengthen the position that we take, but you must choose. You know, there are a lot of people in the church today who choose to go through an appearance of Christianity, but whether it's, you know, getting drunk or getting high or sleeping around with their girlfriend or their boyfriend or whatever it happens, they're, they're trying to, to stand in two different worlds. Make up your mind. Like Elijah says, how long are you going to be crippled? Halt is the idea in King James. How long will you be crippled between two positions? They're crippled. They can't, they can't have fun with the world anymore, and they can't have fun with their Christian friends because they're compromised on both sides. Choose. Choose the God you're going to serve 
And understand, for the Christian, he's called us to go in and take the land. There is a territory God has called you to take. There, and by that I mean, there is something he has called you to do in your life. There is something that he's called you to do. You say, I don't have time. I, I can't find time. You're never going to find the time because the time is right in front of you. That's why you can't find it because you're, not, you're looking right through it. The time is what we take for ourselves to do. It's a priority issue. We choose to do certain things over other things. We choose to be strong. We choose to be of good courage. We choose to go into this land and to set the sole of our foot down and to walk in it. God says, I will honor that. Look, the land that you and I are going into is full of giants. The land that you and I are going into is full of obstacles. And by that, when I say the land, I'm just talking about my personal life, your personal life the life of this ministry right here. It's full of obstacles. The world is full of obstacles. But if I'm going to live as a believer, then I must choose to obey the one who bought me and to go in, to be strong, and to go in and to do whatever it is that he's called me to do. For you, it could be fear, it could be anger, it could be lust, it could be drunkenness, it could be gambling. I mean, we, we, we can go down the list. It could, how can I have strength in the midst of my sickness? Lean on him. He will strengthen you. Does that mean he's going to remove it, heal you? We've seen people healed here before, and we've seen many people who have not been healed in the sense we would say healing, but strengthened nevertheless to face the next day, to take the next step. Isn't that the issue? Isn't that the issue? To, fa to face the next day, to take the next step, whatever it is. He says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. We were purchased with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you've received the gift, if you've accepted that, and you are his, then if I am his, then I am no longer my own. And he then has to be the one I call him, Lord, which means master, which means king. And if he is Lord and master and king, then I can tell you he's got a territory for you to take. And I don't know what it is in your life, depending upon your age and where you are, and you know, although I, I don't know that, but you probably have a good idea of it. He's the only one who can give you victory. You say, what is this blessing and, and prosperity and success that he's talking about? Well, if you want an idea of that, you can look it up later on in Psalm 1. The one, he says the man, but the one who meditates on God's word, the one who spends time in God's word, the one who looks to the Lord and what the Lord has to say is like a tree planted by streamed rivers of water, whose leaf never withers, whose roots go down into good soil and bears fruit in every season. That's what we want to be because ultimately that's what we'll receive reward for, for having trusted him to trust his word and to follow him. Look, in a moment, we're going to, the worship team's going to come up here, and as we sing this song, the prayer partners will be up here. Please, you've got giants in your life and obstacles in your life. Come and pray with someone who can pray with you about those situations. Don't just walk out, but spend some time and pray with them. We want to help you, and that's where we find the victory, in prayer, as we go to him. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the victory that we have in Christ. We thank you for those things, Lord, that you say you have already given to us. But it's up to us, Lord, to go into that territory and to take the land. And so how that plays out in each person's life, I don't have any idea in the room of hundreds of people. I have an idea what it means in mine. And each one of us is responsible for coming to you individually. But to whom else would we go, Lord? You alone have the words of life. Who else would we go to? You alone are in control. Who else would we go to? You alone are king 
and sovereign over all things. And so, Lord, whether it's for health, Lord, whether it's for rescue from a disaster, whether it's for the salvation of a loved one, for all these things and a and hundred more reasons, Lord, we come to you knowing that you alone hear our prayers. You alone will answer. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails, when darkness fails, his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy hill, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the side. And again, if you would like prayer, please come on up. There will be prayer partners. Have a great week.